Good morning, friends. I'd like to get back to you again on uh, the principles of the doctrine of Christ. And today we're back into Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Uh, we, we did cover repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Now we're moving on into the second verse where it's discussing the doctrine of baptisms. These are for those people who have understood, first and foremost, the first principle, which is repentance from dead works. They're no longer trying to attain salvation through their own works. They're absolutely aware of their inability to come to God. They recognize their inherited sin and the total corruption of their flesh and the desires of the of the of the flesh to, to live in uh, in opposition to God. And that with that in mind, then we have the next step, which is recognition of a Savior and who he is and why we need him. So therefore, this, with repentance from dead works, you've turned away from that and you've turned toward Christ, which is the Savior of the world. At that stage, then, we have faith toward God. And that is through Jesus Christ, which we covered again. Now, now we move into, with those first two principles firmly laid as the foundation we move into the doctrine of baptisms the first the, the next step here in in verse 2 and in this essence the the or in this in this particular instance the doctrine of baptisms is speaking a little bit differently it's not solely on the the regenerative baptism aspect of it but it, it does cover that in it's more in terms of a cleansing and and the the cleanness of, of a person and how one is made clean which is of course by faith if we go to Acts uh, 15 verse 9 it, he says it put no difference between them and us purifying their hearts by faith so we start with that aspect um, also 1 Peter 3.21 discusses this idea in that he says, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he's telling us this is not a this is not a physical washing. Rather, it is a spiritual cleansing. Again, done by faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is of utmost important importance to, to understand. Um, we see how that is done, and I'm, I, I'd like to go back to the Old Testament to, to show a little bit more clearly how that's done. So the discussion should look at a, a little bit at the cleansing aspect, how we are made clean, and then from that point we want to find what does that look like in our life today. So, again, I'd like to go back to Psalm 51. Uh, I'm, ideally, you would read the whole psalm. I'm, I'm not going to, but I want to just focus on a couple of verses there, maybe the 7th and 8th, where David is telling us, well, he's telling God, purge me with hyssop and make me clean. Again, read the context on that. I... I, I like to put the Bible verses in the in the um, comments section where you can go and read it for yourself. But he's he's telling God to cleanse him. It's not us doing it. We can't sanctify our flesh. We can't make our flesh holy. But God can cleanse our hearts. And also in Psalm 51, he says, Create in me a clean heart. Uh, we could we see the same the same idea in Exodus 12 in the 22nd and 23rd verse. Again, you should read the whole chapter on this. Get the, get the 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 context as you walk through the idea of uh, the the um, Passover. They killed the lamb and they took a bunch of hyssop and they 
dunked it in the basin of blood that they caught from that lamb. And then they wiped that on the doorposts. Again, signifying this is Christ. That Christ is our Passover, it tells us. And uh, this blood put on the doorpost caused death to pass over. Again, I cannot overstate the importance of this fact that death is no longer having sting in us as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, or is that 2 Corinthians chapter 15, where he's discussing the idea, death has no power. It's lost its, it's lost its power. It passes over us. Why? Because we have eternal life when we believe on the Savior. The, our body, of course, dies. But we pass through that in the, in the spiritual side of things. Uh, obviously, Acts chapter 10 touches on, again, to him give all the prophets witness that whosoever believeth on his name re, uh, has remission of sins. So we find here the same blood. It's the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Which is John the, John the Baptist told us about in, his, in the first chapter of John, approximately the 20th verse there. Speaks of that Lamb of God. This is the Lamb that took away our sin. We, we receive that by faith. Again, I'd like to uh, bring back this point that faith is the hand that grasps the promises of God. So, when we look back to these promises, this circumcision, the, the, the Lord's Passover, uh, the, the flooding of the world, Noah's Ark, um, and the promise given there, that no longer would God cut off all flesh by water. All of these things are picturing the exact same thing. It's a cutting off and destroying the filth of the flesh. What does that look for? Look like in, in the child of God today who believes on those promises received through Jesus Christ? What it looks like we see in first in Romans 6 where he explains so clearly I'm going to have you read the whole chapter on that Romans 6 covers this um, crucifixion of the flesh and new life in Christ raising up with him buried with him in baptism raised up with him in, in, in eternal life now we move to Romans 8 if we walk in the spirit because God has given us his spirit. I, I'm going to go back. I'd like to go back to the Old Testament for just a moment. Go back to Ezekiel 36, 24 through 28. We see so clearly that it is God who is putting a new heart in us. God who is giving us a new spirit. God who is giving us new impulses and causing us to walk in his statutes and his commandments. This is God doing all of that in us. And we believe it. The filth of the flesh has been cut off. That's the promise. We now have peace with God. Romans 5.1 Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, with Romans 8, again, you need to read the entire chapter on this to gain the context, but there's a new life in Christ. You're walking in the Spirit. And the Spirit of God is not... Uh, it's not allowing you to live in the flesh. There's a new life here in which one is has a new master. Christ cannot live in your heart. And the Spirit of God living in your heart cannot desire sin. It's a new heart. You're a new creature. You're a new creation. All things, old things are passed away. All things are made new, Paul tells us. These things are, are what the life of a child of God looks like. Now, to be very clear, the life 
of a child of God, one who has been born again, who lives in the Spirit, as Romans 8.1 talks about, that life can look identical to the life of the Pharisee. The Pharisee worked tirelessly to attain salvation, finding that he did not need Jesus Christ. He already was doing the will of God in the flesh. That person does a great job, lives a fantastic life morally, ethically, so on and so forth, but without the peace of God. But it looks identical to the life of a child of God, one who has been born again. That's an identical feature externally. But there's a difference. On the one hand, one is a fruit of faith, fruits of the Spirit, and the other is the work of the flesh. How do they then feed the next person? They don't, on the one hand. If it's a work of the flesh, it's for you. So, God is not pleased that you did not kill someone today. I, I know that's extreme, but God, that's not what pleases God. He's pleased when you have faith in his son. But for the man who is working for his salvation, he feels that he pleased God. And he sacrificed his time, effort, money. Everything is sacrificed for God, but it's actually an internal feeling of piety and self-righteousness in that he didn't kill someone today or whatever the sin may be. What, whatever is done in that it's for the person's benefit, that is a self-work. It's not for God. The flip side is for the child of God who has been born again, that which he does is for his neighbor's benefit and because it pleases God. Well, it's, it pleases God because it's by faith. So it's, it's through Jesus Christ. The, the benefits come in that others are blessed by this, by these fruits. That generally means it's Jesus Christ is preached. So, nobody, well, very, there's only one that would benefit if you didn't kill someone today. Mur murder, of course, is not, it's not acceptable in any case. Nevertheless, one person would die if you murdered someone today. But many live if the gospel is preached. The good news of Jesus Christ, the redemption of the world, if that is preached and people believe it, many live. And that is the real fruit. When we talk about fruits, the Bible uses slightly different terms on this, but one of the things it does oftentimes is it speaks of the fruit of the, of the, of the uh, grain and whatever, the, the fruit of the harvest. That is always the seed, the promised seed. And we go back to, to Genesis uh, the 3.15 in which the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. That seed is the same seed we see sown by the parable of the sower. And and it, it speaks of that, it, that the sower sowed on four types of soil, some of which it fell among thorns, some, some on stony ground, um, in by the wayside and the birds picked it up, and some fell on good soil. But that which fell on good soil actually sprang up and bore fruit. Some of the others, they sprang up. Not all. Some were picked up by the weeds, whatever, or by the birds. Some, some were choked out by the cares of the world. Some were uh, sprang up. And then, and then the, uh, it was stony soil. So that without depth of soil, it didn't, 
it didn't it wasn't deeply rooted but it did spring up so there was life there for a time but it didn't bring fruit this fruit of that grain that is planted there that seed that is planted there is always talking about Jesus Christ the seed of the woman that would crush the head of the serpent this seed that is brought forth in that good soil some 30 fold some 60 fold some 100 fold that is always Jesus Christ spread again so when it when when that when that seed grows and bears fruit it it's cast out again it's broadcast we don't just sit there and, and continue to eat the same seed that grows in us or the grain that comes forth from it no we pass it on and we keep broadcasting it on the soil and and as Jesus explains in that parable the 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 field in that parable is is the earth the entire world so the the seed keeps being cast forth. And I, I know I'm veering off a little bit here, but I want to try to show the proper fruit. Uh, John the Baptist in the, in the third chapter of Matthew explains to bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and that's, that's uh, the, the proper fruit is... The fruit of the Spirit. As we know in John 16, that Spirit only speaks of Christ. It doesn't speak of itself, but it speaks of Christ. So these are the things that we need to focus on and understand first and foremost. Bring it back to the first principle. Repentance from dead works. Don't try... To live that Christian lifestyle, the biblical lifestyle, in the flesh. Instead, give up on your flesh. Deny yourself and live in Christ. Recognize that you are unable to do anything to please God. And when you're completely crushed by the law, and recognize with 100% certainty that you are unable in any way, shape, or form to come to God under your own power, which it tells us this in Psalm 14 again. Then you finally come to a spot where you realize, I need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. And when He comes into my heart, when God has drawn me to Christ, shown me my inability through the law and drawn me to Christ where I find my salvation then there's proper fruit that comes forth and that's the fruit of the spirit which God has placed in me by faith and of course we could go to Galatians 5 and, and, and read the end of that chapter the fruits of the spirit but those are God working through us And that's what this baptism looks like, this cleansing. It's a, it's a cleansing of the impulses. Our impulses are changed. It doesn't mean that we won't sin. It doesn't mean that we won't stumble or fall at some point. But it does mean that we have a new heart. And of course, 1 John chapter 3 would cover that quite clearly, that one who is born again, where when Christ lives in you, you cannot sin. You cannot desire to commit sin and live in that. And so, for all that are listening, believe first and foremost that you are unable to do good in the flesh. But we have a Savior who made it possible for us to freely do the will of God through Christ. And that's where life is, and that's where freedom is. Again, God is not pleased that we're not sinning today. He's pleased when we believe on his Son. That doesn't mean we should sin. 
It means we can't when Christ lives in us. And it's a totally different impulse. We have a different will, different desires, a different heart. We're a new creature, a new creation. As I said in Romans 8, we should read the whole chapter. I'm not going to do that today. We're running out of time, so I'm going to let it go at that. God bless you all. See you next time.